Hello class, this is Kristen Lazarova and welcome to our first video in this module on sensation and perception. There are three major concepts that you'll be exploring in this module. These include sensation and perception, the individual senses, and then the principles of perception. In this particular video, you're going to be exploring sensation, sensory receptors, and systems. You're also going to get an overview of what perception is and top-down versus bottom-up processing. You're also going to be given an overview of the overall process of sensation and perception. And you're going to learn some basic terminology, including transduction, difference threshold, and sensory adaptation. And then we'll conclude by discussing some of the factors that affect perception. So let's get started. The key point that you'll be getting from this video is that psychology examines biological processes of sensation and how these can be combined to create our perceptions. Our sensory systems are responsible for providing information about our surroundings, and then this allows us to successfully navigate and to interact with our environments. If you were, let's say, standing in the midst of this street scene, you'd be absorbing and processing numerous pieces of sensory input. Before discussing each of our extraordinary senses individually, it's necessary for us to cover some basic concepts that apply to all of them. The physical process during which our sensory organs, those that are involved in hearing and taste, for example, respond to external stimuli is called sensation. Sensation happens when you eat noodles or when you feel the wind on your face or when you hear a car horn that's honking in the distance. And sensory receptors, those are specialized neurons that respond to specific types of stimuli. We have various sensory systems, and these many of these you're familiar with, but some of, that, some of these you have not probably thought of before. The ones you're most familiar with include vision and hearing, smell, taste, and touch. But we also have balance and body position, movement, pain, and temperature. In contrast with sensation, we have perception, and this is the psychological process. It's making sense of the stimuli or interpreting the stimuli. So it's during this process that you're able to identify, let's say, a gas leak in your home or a song that reminds you of a specific afternoon spent with friends. Perception involves two different forms of processing. We have what's called bottom-up processing, and this is the system in which perceptions are built from sensory input. So the information that you're receiving through your eyes, through your ears, for example, this is bottom-up processing. We are receiving this information, and then it goes to our brain, and then we perceive that information. Top-down processing, though, is the interpretation of sensations, and this is influenced by our available knowledge, our experiences, and our thoughts. So bottom-up processing might involve, if I were to smell gas in my home, I might just smell something that is unusual, whereas top-down processing allows me to interpret that information. Perhaps I've heard something about the smell of gas, or perhaps I know someone who had a gas leak, or perhaps I saw something on TV and, um, and learned more about this. So I'm basing this on my experience, on my previous knowledge or things I've thought about before. Now read this quote out loud. All right, did you notice the extra the in the sentence? If not, it's likely because you were reading this from a top-down approach. Having a second the doesn't make sense. We know this, our brain knows this, and it doesn't expect there to be a second one 
so we have a tendency to skip right over it. In other words, your past experience has changed the way you perceive the writing in the triangle. A beginning reader, one who is using bottom-up approaches by carefully attending to each piece would be less likely to make this error. So how does something go from a physical process to a psychological process? This happens through transduction. This is how it works. Sensory systems convert real world information into electrical information that can then be processed by the brain. Our sensory systems have sensory receptors, which are specialized neurons that respond to specific types of stimuli. When sensory information is detected by a sensory receptor, sensation has occurred. So for example, light that enters the eye causes chemical changes in cells that line the back of the eye. These cells can relay messages then in the form of action potentials, as you learned when you were studying biopsychology. And so these relay the messages to the central nervous system. The conversion from sensory stimulus energy to action potential to our central nervous system is what is known as transduction. For a stimulus to cause an action potential, it first has to be strong enough to be detected. And researchers defined absolute threshold as the minimum amount of stimulation needed to detect a stimulus half of the time. And this is a concept that's associated with sensation. For a stimulus to cause an action potential, it first has to be strong enough to be detected. This absolute threshold explains why you don't smell the perfume someone's wearing in a classroom unless they're somewhat close to you. Sometimes we're more interested in how much difference in stimuli is required to detect a difference between them. And this is known as the just noticeable difference or JND or difference threshold. Unlike the absolute threshold, the difference threshold changes depending on the stimulus intensity. As an example, imagine yourself in a very dark movie theater. If an audience member were to receive a text message that caused the cell phone screen to light up, chances are that many people would notice the change in illumination in the theater. But if the same thing happened in a brightly lit arena, like during a basketball game, very few people would notice. The cell phone brightness does not change, but its ability to be detected as a change in illumination, it varies dramatically between the two contexts. Ernst Weber proposed this theory of change in difference threshold in the 1830s, and it's become known as Weber's law. The difference threshold is a constant fraction of the original stimulus, as this example illustrates. Sensory adaptation happens when a sensory stimulus doesn't change and we stop paying attention to it. This happens because if a stimulus doesn't change, our receptors quit responding to it. So imagine yourself going into the library. It's a noisy library, let's say. Perhaps there's people talking. There are people who are studying and maybe you're hearing the flipping of the pages. And at first it's very annoying. You've probably had this happen before at some point. But you sit down anyways, and you begin to study. And over time, you stop noticing the sounds around you. Those sounds that once annoyed you, the people talking and chatting and perhaps talking about things other than whatever it is that they're studying, they're no longer bothering you because you've adapted to that stimulation. And again, this is because if the stimulus is not changing and our receptors have stopped responding to it. Another great example of this happens when we leave the radio on in our car after we park it at home for the night. When we listen to the radio on the way home from work, the volume seems reasonable, but the next morning when we start the car, we might be startled by how loud the radio is. We adapted to the constant stimulus, the radio volume, the night before, over the course of the previous day, and the increased volume at various times. So let's check your learning. Light enters the eye and is converted into electrical signals that can be processed by the brain. This process is called, pause the video for a moment if you need a moment to think about this. 
If you selected transduction, you're right. Remember that transduction involves the conversion of stimulus energy into electrical impulses. In the case of vision, that stimulus energy is in the form of light. Let's try another one. Charlie works for a moving company. He can easily tell the difference in weight between two small boxes, but can't detect any difference at all between the weight of the washing machine and the weight of the dryer. This is an example of, if you need to pause this, go ahead. If you select a difference threshold, you're right. And the reason that this is the correct answer is because the weight difference between the washing machine and the dryer is so subtle, it's so small, that a difference cannot be detected. That difference threshold has not been met. We've looked at some basics behind the concept of sensation. Now let's take some time and look at some basics behind perception. Let's first look at some factors that affect perception. One factor is sensory adaptation. And you just learned about this as we were exploring sensation. And this is where we don't perceive stimuli that remains relatively constant over prolonged periods of time. So for example, when you first enter a quiet room, you might hear the clock ticking, but over time you become unaware of the ticking. The ticking is still affecting your sensory receptors, but you're no longer perceiving the sound. Attention is another factor that can affect perception. And inattentional blindness is where we fail to notice something that's completely visible because we're not paying attention. Under the video content in this module, I have an example of this, and I'd encourage you to click on that content and watch the brief video. Think about your own real life experience with inattentional blindness. Think about, for example, driving down the road and you're paying attention to cars as they go by. You're paying attention to cars to make sure that no one slams on their brakes in front of you, that no one cuts you off. You're paying attention to the turns that people make and the speed at which they're driving. But because you're paying attention to the cars and you're used to seeing cars on the road, you might fail to notice other things that could affect your safety and theirs. You might miss that there's a motorcyclist who's next to you. You might miss that there's a bicyclist who is pulling out in front of you. You might also miss an animal. So each of these can be explained by inattentional blindness where we're not noticing something that's completely visible because we're not paying attention. Motivation is another factor that can affect perception. For example, sometimes we think that we hear something like a phone ringing when it's not because we're motivated to perceive it. Maybe we're waiting for an important phone call. Have you ever found yourself noticing things that other people don't? Maybe you notice a sound, you hear something that someone else doesn't. Perhaps there were factors about your mental state or your cognition that made you more sensitive and then required less stimulus and intensity for you to notice that sound than the other person. This is what is called signal detection theory, where a change in stimulus detection is actually a function of our current mental state. Our beliefs, values, and prejudices, and our expectations can also affect our perception. I would encourage you to think about your own experiences with how you've perceived things, how you've perceived food, how you've perceived music, and how that perception has been based upon your own expectations, your own beliefs, and your own values or prejudices. So for example, people who hold positive attitudes towards low-fat food are more likely to rate foods with low-fat labels as tasting better than people with less positive attitudes about low-fat products. We might say the same could be true for someone who's a vegetarian. Someone who's a vegetarian might find that food that is made with beans and vegetables is much more tasty than someone who is not a vegetarian. And this has to do with their own beliefs and their own values affecting their perception. Life and cultural experiences can also affect perception. For example, one study found that people from Western cultures where there's a perceptual context of buildings with straight lines were more likely to experience certain types of visual illusions, like 
the Miller Lyre illusion than individuals from non-Western cultures, where they're more likely to live in round huts. If you reflect in your textbook on the Miller Lyre illusion, you'll notice that in that illusion, you are determining the length of lines. And these lines that you're assessing have arrows that are pointing either over the line or in, an, or in the opposite direction. So let's take a look at this. Here's the Miller Lyer illusion. So the shared experiences of people within a given cultural context, so within our culture or people who live in another culture, their shared experiences, that can have a very significant effect on perception. For example, in a study that was done in the early 1960s, researchers demonstrated that people from Western cultures were more prone to experience certain types of visual illusions than people from non-Western cultures and vice versa. So in this example here, this illusion, in this illusion, Westerners were more likely to experience what's called the miller lyer illusion. And the lines appear to be different lengths, but they're actually the same length. So let's just check what you've learned so far. Celine is reading her psychology text. The activation of receptors in her retina is called blank, and her interpretation of the stimuli as particular words is called blank. Which one of these is correct? Go ahead and pause this if you need a moment to think about this. The correct answer is C. Celine is reading her psychology textbook and the activation of receptors in her retina is called sensation. Her interpretation of the stimuli as particular words is called perception. Let's try another one. While reading new updates on a social networking site, Christine ignores the scrolling news feed and the changing advertisements on the right side of the screen. She's demonstrating what? If you need a moment to think about this, Go ahead and pause the video. Christine is demonstrating inattentional blindness, and this is because she's not noticing something that is right in front of her because she's motivated to pay attention to something else. What have you learned in this video? Well, in this video, you've learned about sensation, sensory receptors, and systems. You've also learned about perception, and top-down versus bottom-up processing. You've also learned about the overall process of sensation and perception. You've learned what transduction is, and you now know what a difference threshold is. You've also learned about sensory adaptation and the factors that affect perception. As you review these concepts, I would encourage you to think about how you would apply these concepts to your own life. When have you experienced these things? The more you can relate what you're learning to yourself, to your own life and your own experiences, the more meaningful learning is going to be and the easier it will be for you to remember what it is that you've learned. In our next video, we're going to be learning about sensory systems. We're going to spend some time learning about vision. We'll learn about hearing. We'll learn about smell and taste and additional sensory systems.